But thanks for coming, everyone. We might get underway, but I recognize that's what we did last time. Um, as you may or may not be aware, this is one of the projects within the 25 that we've got for the Killing Green Reset Program. This is a fairly unique project because it's the only one that brings together, it's a much larger uh, focus. A lot of the projects are very um, small area that they're covering and we're extrapolating from there, whereas Fabio is doing the opposite and we get down there looking at the whole region and looking at a very large time frame that's 2050. So it's a really interesting project from that perspective. And there's been the challenges of trying to bring as much of the data together that's available uh, because we have this big project to begin with to try to use as much of the data as possible. So um, really interesting project from that perspective and we've been working with both Kiko Luzano and Fabio Bastieri in order to um, try to incorporate as much of that data as we could coming forward. So they're finishing off the project now. And this is just an opportunity for us to see what's um, gone into the project and then provide some feedback for them for their final report, particularly in the area of what does this actually mean for management. So when you're looking at, at the, the um, project itself, really one of the big focuses we're trying to say is what does this mean for management implications going forward and how we can use this type of model in the future. So, okay. Okay, so before I start the presentation itself, I would like to acknowledge the team, of course, this has been a team effort working for more than three years, but in particular, as you will see, this is a modeling project, and in all modeling projects, the star players are the modelers. In this case, is Brad Stafford, who modeled the land processes, uh, and uh, Hector Lozano Montes, who is here with me, who has done the modeling on the marine side of things. Because this talk is almost essentially on the marine side, Hector is the star players. <coughs> star player, if we are here two weeks before the end of the project with all the simulations done, everything uploaded online, is thanks to effort that uh, Hector has put on this. So I would like to acknowledge him again. Everything I present today is online. I'll show you at the end uh, the link again, and I'll show you how to go and check so if you want to check any details later on, you can go online and have a look. Okay, so technically, these were the objectives we were supposed to achieve at the beginning of the project. I'm going to show you now how we went through it. I don't expect you to read all that. I just highlighted in red the keywords of this talk. So this is mostly, as Stuart has said, about integrating knowledge, engaging stakeholders in order to agree on what scenarios are uh, need, needed to be modeled. Is mostly about the future, so we have a long-term uh, perception of what might happen to the region. It's about modeling and how modeling can inform decision making. But beside the, besides the technicality of the wording of the uh, project objectives, the real purpose of this project, as for the overall Kimberley program was to address the aspiration and the challenges that uh, 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 relate to this uh, region. There has been a number of documents published in the last five to 10 years by different groups, uh, both uh, indigenous and not indigenous uh, state and government departments. If you go through them, each of them have different language and different emphasis. But the key message, or more or less of all this document, is summarized by those four points there. Um, the aspiration for the region is to acknowledge the region's Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal cultural heritage, which is facilitating economic growth, managing population and settlement growth, and conserve the natural, natural assets. This is what everyone wants to achieve for the region. Now, the question, of course, is... Um, sorry. The question, of course, is can all these be achieved at the same time? And most important, can this be achieved under the uh, potential challenge of uh, climate change? And if it can, what kind of management strategies have to be implemented in order to make it more likely to achieve? Now, because of this framework, there are a few um, consequences that have affected our uh, modeling project. Obviously, the questions that are listed above are regional. They are not local um, questions. As a result, we have to model the overall region in the Kimberley. So the, the answers we are not going to provide are not related to a specific park or to a specific beach, are more about the overall state of the system. 
At the same time, those questions are not about next year, the next five years, or something like uh, projected in the future, at least one generation. So our modeling will be projected up to the year 2050. 2050 was chosen because just before the project started, I attended an Academy of Science workshop about the future of Australia to 2050. And uh, for three days, all we spoke about was climate change and population growth, which are eventually the main uh, driver, as you will see, about, of this project. So that's why we wanted to align the scope, the uh, time scale of this project to uh, that exercise. It follows that the management, um, the information we produce, which is relevant to management, is also going to be at the spatial uh, scale, which is regional, and at the time scale, which is quite long. Now, two things have to be clarified before I go into the, the talk to make sense of this. First of all, when we talk about decision making, we implicitly talk about prediction. Now, some people are very comfortable about this, some people not. When we have to make a decision, we normally is because we have two choices or more than two choices. Otherwise, there is no decision to be taken. And when we have two or more choices in order to decide, we need to try to imagine what each choice will lead to so that we can choose which of the outcome we prefer. And this exercise of imagining what the choice leads to is a prediction. So the prediction here is going to be carried out through a model. Now, the obvious question that we always have to deal with as modelers is it's fair enough to want to predict something, but you know, is it possible to predict anything to the year 2050 at all? And um, I think some of uh, the issue can be clarified when we as, uh, understand a little bit better what we mean by prediction. If we are thinking about saying how the system will be in 2050, that is what I wouldn't even call it a prediction. I could, would call that a prophecy. Okay, this is what you you go and have your um, future told by some uh, mystical uh, reader in the future. What we are trying to do here is say what might happen to the region in 2050 under very specific circumstances. So I want to give you an example so that we uh, because it's going to be fundamental for the entire presentation. If I ask any of you what you're going to do on the 5th of February at 6 p.m., most likely you're going to answer, I don't know. And of course, we don't know it's so far ahead of us. But if I say, well, imagine now the 5th of February is a Sunday. Imagine the weather is gorgeous. There is no sea breeze. You know, there is an easterly winds all day. What are you going to do at 6 p.m.? Then you may say, well, in that case, maybe I'll go to the beach and have a barbecue on the beach. And if I say, well, if the 5th of February instead is a Monday and the weather is awful and the fermental doctor is blowing like crazy, you might say, well, in that case, at 6 o'clock, we're probably cooking dinner or coming back from the gym. Now, suddenly, the question, what are you going to do on the 5th of February at 6 p.m., is more reasonable. Before, it didn't make any sense to even try to answer it. Now that we have specified very clearly under what condition we are asking the question, then we can discuss. We might not know exactly what we will do, but it's, we can discuss it. It's, it's a meaningful question now. So this leads to the overall framework of the work. More than almost two thirds of the project went into trying to define what are these circumstances, under which circumstances we want to say something about the system. And this means specify the scenarios, what might happen to the region, specify what management strategies are available, what might we implement in terms of management in order to address the scenario. And finally, how does the system work? Because how the system is going to react to the scenario and the management, this depends on how we think the system works now. So these three steps have been uh, driving the entire process. So let's start from the scenarios. What might happen to the region? An infinite number of things might happen to the region. When we decide to model, we need to focus on uh, scenarios which are plausible and are relevant. For example, North Korea might bomb uh, the Kimberley next month. If that happens, there is no worry for us. No, marine conservation is the least of the problems. Whether the scenario is plausible or not is not relevant to this exercise. 
So what under um, consultation with uh, some stakeholders here, we have the list of the people who helped us in this step, we basically realized that the main two pressures we are concerned about for the region are going to be climate change and social economic development. Now, obviously, both climate change and social economic development are a bundle of, of processes. Climate change include warming, sea level rise, precipitation. Social economic development include uh, jobs, population growth, infrastructure growth. However, within this bundle, the processes are very highly correlated. So, for example, thinking about development, if we have population growth, then obviously infrastructure also has to develop. Otherwise, there is no way for people to live in a region that would move out. Similarly, if warming occurs, then sea level rise is more likely to be um, a problem because of thermal expansion in, in the water. So we can uh, assume that there are going to be correlation within the processes which are bundled under the label of uh, climate impact and the social economic development. So once we have decided this, we have decided to divide the level, the intensity of the impact of these two stressors into low, medium, and high. So we ended up having three by three nine scenarios to address. Mm -hmm. The definition, the exact definition of the nine scenarios is online. I'll show you at the end how to go and have a look at it. But roughly, climate impact is represented mostly by the uh, IPCC, International Panel for Climate Change, the uh, representative community pathways. These are scenarios that the IPCC has published and a lot of people around the world use so that they can compare their work. The scenarios depend on the amount of uh, carbon that is released in the atmosphere in the future. This is what you know uh, things like the Paris Paris uh, um, Agreement are about. And so we took three of these scenarios. One and each of these scenarios here is the label says what temperature warming we might have by mid-century. They are certain certainty and what kind of sea level rise we might have. In the this information was provided to us by uh, Neil Fang from the project 2.7, and they have done the regional downsampling, which has eventually fed into the uh, marine model we're going to show you soon. But what regards the specification of the scenarios for the development, this is mostly being done by the team who has done the modeling on land, but we have been checking with a few experts in the area. And they are mostly based on the extent of population growth we might expect in the future, the amount of uh, agriculture in terms of uh, cropland, development on farming, and development on tourists, plus infrastructure, and a few more details, which, are, as I said, are online. So this sets the scenarios. The next question is, how would we manage the um, impacts that come from the scenarios? Again, we consulted few stakeholders and we agreed on two things. First of all, as management tools, we are going to address marine parks, the extension of sanctuary zone within the marine parks, the fishery regulation and the tourism uh, uh, regulation. These are the stressors on which we are going to apply our uh, management approaches. And for what regards the pressure, the level of regulation, we started with the idea of using high, medium, and low, as we did for the scenarios, where medium is roughly what we expect is going to be implemented today. High is something a little bit better, low is a little bit less. And again, we are assuming a high level of correlation between these uh, management instruments under the assumption that these are mostly driven by the uh, social attitude for, uh, and appetite for conservation in the state. After consultation, we have been suggested that maybe we were too optimistic. So we were suggested, why don't you consider a, a strategy that uh, basically implements a considerable reduction in conservation in the region? And someone suggested to us, why don't you consider what would happen if there was basically no conservation at all in the region? And this is interesting because we were quite skeptical about this. We decided to uh, include it anyway. 
but roughly two or three weeks after that recommendation, Trump won the election in the US. So suddenly this strategy option became, uh, looked a little bit more credible than um, when we decided to include it. Okay, now, how does the system work? This is where modeling comes into place. Think back, you know, three or four years ago when we started the project, the assumption was that we know almost nothing about that region. But uh, modelers had to come up with some uh, conceptual understanding, conceptual model of how the region works. And uh, so the conceptual understanding was that there are a number of processes that happen on land which are driven by economic development. These are modeled by the ALSIS model, which uh, models uh, basically simulates how this develops on land. These processes are going to interface with the marine environment through a number of processes which are mostly occurring at the interface between land and marine, which is um, on the coast, of course. Then we have our marine environment, which is represented by a food web, 59 groups. And this food is going to be affected by what's happening on land, the um, oceanographic processes, and of course climate change, which at that day we assume was mostly uh, a function of war, uh, uh, warming and sea level rise. And of course we knew that climate change is also going to affect the oceanographic process of the regional scale and is going to affect what's happening on the interface on the coastal processes. And our understanding was, okay, we need to model all this under the nine scenarios that I described before. Now, coming up with this picture is one thing that is more or less easy because it is more or less obvious. It's a completely different issue than parameterize two models so that they can actually simulate this. Now, this is the part where we have to do a considerable literature review, check all the information that was available in different publications and the reports and so on, and most important, incorporate the information from a number of uh, uh, other projects within the Timberly uh, project. Now, this took more than one year, and this is where the ALSIS team and Hector have done most of their work. Just imagine for each of these groups you need to decide how much biomass there is, where it is, what kind of diet is, uh, is, is affecting this group, and so on. And when you have to do that, you need to put a number. So it's not enough to say there is more sea grass there than here. You have to say how much there is there and how much there is there. Of course, much of this information is highly uncertain. So you also need to tell the model how uncertain it is because the model is going to account for that uncertainty in order to check, the, to carry out the sensitivity analysis on the model. This is a quite contentious issue when we models have to present our result. On the one hand, you might think, <clears throat> well, there is so much uncertainty about anything in the region, how can you trust that this parameterization makes sense? On the other hand, after you go through the effort of checking everything and assigning a number, assigning the uncertainty, making sure that the model tells you that that combination of parameters makes sense from the uh, physical and biological perspective, what you get is by far the best snapshot of your understanding of how the region functions. Mm -hmm. So for us modelers, this is a very important legacy that this project leaves uh, for the future. If in 10 years or 20 years time anyone wants to go and check, they can go and go to our website, as I will show you at the end, or uh, look uh, directly at the input to the model and basically have spell out in terms of numbers what our uh, understanding from the community perspective, not just us as modelers, is of the functioning of a system today, which in this case of the modeling was uh, 2015. Now, all this information is on the website, but just to, um, I would like to show you. Um, one way to see this is, this is the food group, as I said, that we had before. We need to understand, of course, that each uh, group is connected by two other groups through the diet. So if you want to go and check, you can put your cursor, I'll show you how to get to this page. And you can see for each group, 
which group affects that group and which group is affected by them. And most important for each group, you have uh, a description of uh, the data we have for the model, where the data came from, does it come from the region, does it come from what's complete computed by the model, and the information that comes from the publication, what the, uh, the publication was. So you can check the different groups at the different um, quality of the of the uh, of the input. In this case, for example, the input to Minecraft is older <coughs> in time than what I showed you before. So you can go and check and have uh, your own judgment about the quality of the parameterization itself. So now going back. Okay. Now, after all these major efforts, as I said, it took more than two years to agree on the scenario, the other management strategy, uh, parameterize the models and decide what the model should do. Finally, you press a button, and <coughs> by miracle, we're going to find out what is supposed to happen to the region in 2050. Now, the results are going to be divided into three groups. We have the output from uh, the land based modeling, which is going to uh, generate an input for the marine. Uh, model, and then we have the analysis of the scenarios done for with uh, eco uh, eco -pop with eco scene, which tells us how the food web is going to react to the different scenarios, and then we have the analysis of the strategies, how the strategy might change the impact on the food web. So let's start from uh, the uh, analysis. I'm not going to describe in detail the output of the land uh, processes, but for the, uh, all the scenarios that I mentioned before, the uh, ALSIS online, which simulates the land process, is going to uh, produce maps, so especially explicit, um, every five years or 10 years, depending on how you want to output them, on the different pressures, human pressure and uh, you know, pressure from vessel to vessel, fishing, agriculture, the release of the pollutants and sediments from the main river at different locations on the coast. So imagine having a map like this, but for each scenario. And that is what Hector has, too, has taken and used as uh, input for the marine model. Now, one, one unpleasant surprise for us was that when we talk about climate impact, while it is safe to assume there is a very high correlation between warming and sea level rise, we do not know what the correlation is going to be between warming and precipitation regime in the region. So this is the work done by the ALSIS team. Uh, when they did this, it was more or less a few months ago, two years ago, they could not find anyone who would be able to say, yes, in the region you will have more precipitation or less precipitation as a result of climate change. So we were forced to take every scenario and split it into what we call wet and dry, that means higher precipitation and lower precipitation. So suddenly our work doubled. So we had taken uh, scenarios to address rather than just nine. Okay, so let's now address <laughs> the impact of the scenarios on the marine food web. So we have 59 groups in the marine food web and you can go online and check the output year by year, actually month by month, for each of the 59 groups. However, to summarize the result, both for us and for presentation, we need some kind of indicators. So we divide, we decided to uh, generate a number of indicators. Some of them are simply the collection of different groups. Some are the keystone species. This is basically, these are the species that the model itself tells us uh, are the ones for which most of the energy flows go during, um, during the actual functioning of, of the food web. Then we have, of course, some charismatic species that people are particularly interested in. We have uh, bioma, uh, sorry, habitat in the sense of uh, seagrass and mangroves, and the final indicator that is accounting for the total biomass in the system. So most of the results I'm going to show you uh, from now on are related to this indicator, but the raw data for all uh, functional groups is online. Okay, now 
Let's take the indicators I showed before, and let's uh, take the system in the year 2050. And let's check how the system changes among all the 18 scenarios that I mentioned before. So we take basically 18 values for each indicator, and we check the distribution. The distribution here is recorded as relative change, so how much the total biomass changes in 2050 compared to what it was in 2015 at the beginning of the simulation. So negative means less biomass, positive means more biomass. The black line is the median of the distribution. The thick bar is the first and the third quantile of the data. And uh, when it's very, very different, the entire um, um, 1.5 of the extra variance is represented by the, by the thin line. Okay. Now, how to read this? There are some groups that have their own distribution is always on the negative side of the plot. This looks like they are groups that looks like they are loser. Doesn't matter what scenario happens, their biomass is going to increase. <clears throat> Target species, coral, larger sharks, and uh, <coughs> dolphins. Similarly, there are groups that, that might change a lot or might change less, but they uh, biomass is always increased compared to the start of the simulation. This seems to be weak. Another way to look at the data is that there are some groups whose variation is very small. So it looks like it doesn't matter what scenario is going to happen, they are going to vary very little. So it looks like the fate of these indicators is almost set. It doesn't matter what happened, as scenario wise, you might more or less predict the final biomass in 2050. Then there are groups which vary dramatically a lot. So these are most uncertain, is their final state depends crucially on what scenario might occur or eventuate in the future. So what I showed before was the distribution of values, so we have the median and the distribution. If you want to go and check exactly indicator by indicator, what the deviation from the median is due to. We have a plot like this, and I'm going to zoom in one example. Now for this scenario, zero is departure from the, mean, the median that I showed before. And here, when the departure is very high, we plot it, it is not very high, we skip it to, to simplify things. And basically this says that seagrass in this scenario under the dry uh, precipitation regime, which is the pink, is going to decrease, you know, almost 8% compared to the uh, median, and the blue, which is the wet uh, uh, um, precipitation regime, is going to decrease this. Now, if you ever look at all the scenarios, uh, remember pink is dry and uh, blue is wet, you start to get a picture when the Climate is high, almost all by the departure from the mean are on the left, so that means we are losing biomass and the climate is the uh, climate impact is low, all the policy is on the right, so we have more biomass compared to the, to the median. And also you can see that for some groups, there is a big difference between wet and dry scenarios, while for other groups, the difference between wet and dry is much less. But you can start to have a little bit of a look of how the different indicators behave. Now, if you are, rather than being interested in the departure from the mean, you actually want to see the biomass change, this is a very similar plot. And if you zoom in, this is now is change compared to the beginning of the simulation, so compared to 2015. And uh, we see, for example, for target species, we have a loss of biomass of this much with uh, dry um, uh, precipitation regime and this much for wet like, precipitation regime. So all this data is available online. We can go and check each indicator. Now, 
What I showed so far was a difference in the system in 2015, 2050 compared to 2015. It doesn't say anything about how the system changes in between. So these two plots are going to give us a little bit of a clear for that. In blue, we have the total biomass of the system. The black line is the mean of all the AK scenarios, and the blue uh, ribbon is basically the, the, the variance among the AK scenarios. So what, um, the value for biomass is red on this axis, so we are starting by one, which is of course 2015, the ratio with the beginning is one, and then we have a change in biomass, biomass is seen to increase, then it goes down until the end, which is more or less close to where we started from. A little bit less than that. On the green, it's a little bit, it uh, take me a while to describe exactly what this is, but roughly it's a measure of entropy. It's how the, the biomass distribution between groups changes while the system evolves. So this is right on this axis, zero means that the system is exactly as it was in 2015. So it starts to change, then it comes back, that means that now it's more similar to 2015 than it was here, and then it diverges again towards the end of the simulation. Now, specifically for this project, we develop a measure which combines the two of them. So this is a departure of biomass distribution in the system, which also accounts for the, bio, the change in total biomass. So you can see again, system changes, come back, and then changes again. Now, there are two important things about this, this graph. The first one is that the ribbon, the variance, is quite small. That basically means that it doesn't matter how you move within the ribbon, the, the overall shape of this curve stays the same. The overall shape, of course, is not a function of the scenarios, exactly because the scenarios don't uh, change that shape very much. What this means is that this variability is internal to the system. It's not <coughs> due to the stressors, not due to climate change, not due to the stressor from uh, uh, economic um, development. This is a feature of the system. Now, the exact details in time, whether you know this peak is in 2022 or so on, this is highly uncertain. This variation is mostly driven by uh, economic producers. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty on the actual behavior of economic producers in the region. So with a different parameterization, the exact details of the peak and the crop here might change. But the idea that this is actually driven by the system, not by the forcing, is, is important. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, if we believe, as some people says in the literature, that the variation of the biomass distribution in the system affects the resilience of the system, then we should conclude that the resilience of the system when it's here would be different from the resilience of the system when it's here. Again, let's not read the, the time uh, of, of, of this piece. But if, if this assumption is true, we might say that if the system undergoes considerable uh, threats in terms, for example, oil spill or, or uh, bleaching or a set of cyclones and so on, the response of the system might be different if it happens when the system is here or when the system is there. This is a bit uh, speculative at the moment, but it would be very interesting to explore this a little bit further. Okay, now, using the measure that I described before, um, we can calculate the difference in the system at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the runs under all the AP scenarios. And we do some very good simple cluster analysis. And as we see, there are some quite clear clusters uh, coming up of the analysis. Now, the labels there are hard to read. So I now plot the clusters which come from that analysis. Now, a couple of things are quite obvious. First of all, the clustering seems to be dominated by climate impact in sense of world. So we have one cluster that is all the low climate impact, 
one that is all the high value impact, and except for this one here, one that is all the medium impact. Secondly, that if we look at the difference between these two, it looks like the second uh, main pressure is the precipitation regime. But we don't see much difference on this axis. So this plot suggests that when we talk about the intensity of the pressure, first we need to worry about uh, warming, secondly, precipitation re regime, and finally, socioeconomic development. Now, this picture allows us to simplify the next analysis. From now on, we will not deal with eighteen scenarios, but only with three, what we call high pressure, medium pressure, and low uh, pressure. These are, from now on, the scenarios that we will uh, analyze in terms of the strategy impact. This is just an example. Um, if you don't like a very simplified analysis in terms of uh, uh, beginning and end of the simulation, you can go online and for each indicator you can actually see the time series of the evolution under dry and wet precipitation energy. This is the kind of style of visualization we have online for all model runs. Another important outcome from the analysis of the scenario is that Hector is able to go in the model and check how much uh, uh, by running a set of Monte Carlo uh, runs, but this means is that you run the model 500 times in these cases, the model change parameters a little bit depending on the uncertainty that is given to each parameter. And then it tells us how much the system changes as a function of this uncertainty. Also, the model at the beginning, before running the simulation, had told us which group seemed to be harder to, um, to uh, resolve when we try to have uh, conservation of mass within the system. So this is before the simulation, tells us which, group, which groups are less uh, properly defined and this is after the simulation, which group has the most impact on the simulation output. And uh, here are plotted the top groups. So basically, this tells us that if we want to improve our modeling, we need to collect more data. These are the groups that we should focus on uh, the most. And of course, we have enough family producers, as we can expect, but also mostly thin fish, for which we have very little data. And so almost everything has to be worked out by the model governed by the input. Okay, so now we do the same that we've done before, but we analyze the strategy impact on the three scenarios that we have selected. Now, this part here of the presentation is not completed. The last simulation was run on Thursday. The last interpretation in terms of the figure came out on Friday. This stuff here was finally put together yesterday. So this is the part where we, are, we were able to give less um, thought in terms of the uh, analysis. So remember, for sure you remember, this plot here from the analysis of the scenarios, medium value and distribution of variability at the end of the simulation. Now we can do the same for the strategies and I put them together so we can compare. There is one interesting thing to notice is that things don't change very much. Some groups have a little bit less variability, but some others are more or less the same. And also, one thing that seems to be a little bit of a worry is that if anything, the median seems to be moving towards the left, so we seem to have a worse performance on many of the indicators. Now, there is a reason for that. Sorry. If, uh, if you want to know why certain groups have such bi uh, high variability, as we did before for the scenarios, we can zoom in and we can go and check. In this case, I just chose by the one with Sigas and Dugo and check exactly why and where the variability is. So, for example, here we compare for the medium pressure scenario, we compare the medium conservation, which is roughly what's happening today or what is intended to be done today, versus the higher conservation. The pink bar is how the uh, biomass changes 
uh, compared to the uh, median that I showed before. So we have more here compared to that. And the purple bar tells us what the difference is due to, which is the change in conservation level. So this basically says, okay, if we go from this conservation to this conservation, that's what you get. And this is what you're not doing. So we have that for each uh, strategy combination. And as I mentioned before, if you rather than see a comparison towards uh, against the median, you want to see a comparison against the year 2050, you have a plot that is similar to the one I showed before the scenarios. And this is where we need to spend more time to actually analyze the, the size difference. But just to give you a taste of this, specifically for Baramandi. Uh, what we have done here, we take the high pressure, medium pressure, low pressure, we plot them on the same axis, so it's easy to, to compare. Each bar is the um, final biomass given the high, medium, low, and so on uh, strategy. So there are obviously two clear messages here. One is that if you end up in the scenario of high pressure, there is very little space to move. You know, the impact on biomandic is dramatic. And so there is not much, you know, it comes with much miracle by playing these strategies. However, under the medium and low pressure, there is space to move and this can make really a big difference. So the strategies do work if they are implemented properly. There are some technical details here that could take a while to actually uh, explain, but the main issue for, for this presentation is the difference. The other thing to point out is that if we are still optimistic and believe that the reverse and the worst case management strategy, which is basically no conservation at all, are actually unrealistic, then we might understand why there was so much spread In this plot here, it's mostly due to what optimistically we might think are uh, uh, management strategy, which are probably less uh, reasonable to assume at the moment. Okay, so we can do the same game we did before, do some cluster analysis on the combination of different pressures and different conservation options. Don't worry too much about the actual color, it doesn't have any meaning, but it just tells you how many crosses we, we get. And again, this is a little bit of a, sorry, it's a very superficial analysis, but you get a feeling, again, the level of pressure determines a lot of the final outcome. And the management strategies affect a little bit, and mostly, you know, things get really worse when you start mm -hmm. to go from low to reverse and so on. We will have to analyze this better. Okay, so coming to the end here, I want to bring back the system understanding as we had halfway through the project, which is when we implemented the models and we had to run. After we run and we analyze things, the picture is richer. So we learn a number of things. First of all, we learned that the scenarios that we initially thought we had to concern ourselves with only nine, then we find out, oops, actually it's 18. Then if we do some cluster analysis and we study them well, well, really, they can be summarized into three levels of uh, pressures. Then we find out, we discover that the functioning of the food web has its own internal dynamics, which is independent by the, the stress that comes from the scenario. This is an internal behavior which is mostly due to the dynamics of uh, climate producers. We discover from the analysis that the system is mostly bottom up uh, driven because of the uh, poor movement in the area, because of the role of the tides, because of the role of the river system, this is mostly driven by climate producers. So the impact of bottom uh, up uh, processes is stronger than top down processes. We also learned, as I said before, that we do need to attend 
for difference in uh, the uh, precipitation regime because this affects the freshwater runoff, and uh, we do not have this in the previous conception model. Of course, we know more in terms of the details of which pressure that comes from land affects which part of the of the food loop. We also know that when it comes to pressure, warming is the number one. Precipitation regime probably is the number two, and it looks like a socioeconomic development is the number three. We also understand much better the food work itself. We know which groups are um, most likely losers under all scenarios, which one might be winners, which one are mostly uncertain, which one it looks like they fake is, is set already, and we know which groups are most uncertain and which one should focus our attention on the parameterization to improve the model. And finally, we don't have a full picture yet, but we start to understand the role of uh, strategies, how much they can play and what kind of uh, room to move they provide us as a function of the of the three scenarios. So this is, of course, is a much richer picture that we could uh, have a few years ago. This is a project, as I mentioned before, is going to hopefully support the decision making at the regional level, not at the local level. But hopefully, even for managers at the local level, having an understanding of the overall picture might help they work, and also might help them understanding how the information they can provide to us will improve the overall picture and understanding of how the system works. Now, to conclude, as uh, promised, I just want to show you very quickly. I'm sure you can't wait to go and check everything online. So, if you go on the WAMC website, this is our project page. You go here, there is written for more details. You click, you end up on a different website. Uh, most of the some details have to be included, but on your left here, you're going to have another link. This is the interactive food web, which I showed before with all the information about the diets and the biomass. Here are a few issues on um, your explanation what we need about mean by computer model, future, and so on. But more important, the exact definition of the scenarios is here. So you can go and check uh, uh, what values we gave specifically to all scenarios. If you click on the strategies, you can check the exact definition of all strategies from high to worst case and find out why we decided to assign those values. Now, under models, here on the Ecopavivaco scene, you have the definition of all groups, all the data that we provided as input to have the model working. Here, there is a nice table that says of the input data, each of them, where it comes from, what publication we used and what year the publication comes. So you, you can make a little bit your own judgment on uh, on the quality of the parameterization. And finally, if you go on the outputs here, the results, the summaries will have to be uh, improved, but you are going to have all the, on the, the all results page you can go and check all the time series for each group. And uh, for example, here, under all scenarios, wet and dry, you can see the time series for each group for all the whole data. Is that right? That's it. <laughs> oh, so if you want, if you have any technical question about the models, have to be zero. Once, all the questions. Help me. Do we have any questions with 
questions on each of the scenarios to, to run the scenario? Yeah. But as we know, you know, the potential of the, the extremes or the frequency of the extremes can be required in the system of this right. So I was wondering if you looked at the extreme. Now, each scenario is uh, determined by the mean, the mean expectation under that scenario. Yeah. It would be interesting, it would be very interesting to do that in particular in relation to in particular to relation to this because the the level of the extreme, when the extreme actually happens, it changes a lot. It could think about the internal dynamics of the system. So, yeah, it would be very nice to do that. There is no reason why we could not model the actual spike. I mean, if you know, and again, you know, I would assume that the spike here would affect the system different from the spike there. But of course, you know, there are a you number know, of spikes that we mm -hmm. want to model, so we need to decide whether we want to do it and which spike we want to worry about. Well, maybe at least you can exercise tease out what the most important thing to look at. So I think it will be more interesting. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> sort of following that one thought, having done all this work, because I mean, you know, there's so much beyond this, obviously, is there anything that stood out in the dollars that perhaps you didn't anticipate would, or you thought more the case might be? I mean, did you, did you have any sort of read the moments or any, any outcomes that you had? Of course, we did, so we had a lot. Um, now, this was a surprise. To me, this was the number one surprise. I, of course, you know, this is a very nonlinear system. You don't expect things to go linearly, and you don't expect them to be strictly monotonic either. But if you wanted to plot to simulate this, you know, that is probably, you know, um, you probably need a four order polynomial to actually simulate all these jumps up and down. That is definitely, I would have not expected. And would have not expected that you have such a large. Uh, variability in the means and such a long variability in the in the scenarios. So I would have not expected that that dynamic of a system is so independent from the force. So that that needs to be understood. Uh, mm -hmm. and any any other insight? Yeah, actually? yeah probably also the dry and wet conditions were yeah. really, really relevant. Well, mm -hmm. Change in estuaries and the wetlands and the angles here, of course, different are only. Make some species were really sensitive to this condition. So we were a surprise. So, I have a question about whether you, um, so climate change was the biggest pressure that Australia has been facing. Um, there's not much that Western Australia can do so much to actually combat that, maybe even at the national level. I was kind of interested where you think, perhaps, given there's so much. Don't quite understand about the existing processes that are there still, whether potentially underestimate the impact of developments. I mean, the Kimberley region itself is busy enough for a lot of development, water resource development, agriculture, and that sort of thing. And those linkages between, say, um, carbon drive from the prime flooding processes, how much that actually drives, like in the, the initial areas. Just whether you know, Look, um, that yeah, way. it's possible. Uh, in fact, now that you say that, that was another Eureka moment. So, at the beginning, early in the project, many of the people who interacted with us 
we are telling us the main issue is climate change. Forget about economic development because there are so few people there who won't affect the system. It was us actually to say the opposite. No, 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 no. we don't believe that. Right? So that's why we were, you know, really determined to include economic process. Now the surprise is that I'm not going to go back into this, but the econ one of the scenarios for economic development as 2.5% population growth per year. It's huge, okay, it's huge. In fact, um, we actually brought it down a little bit because the region were suggesting for us to use 3%. So 2.5% for us is already a lot. So what I'm trying to say is that we put a development scenario which is probably unrealistically high. And we still we are surprised to see such little impact. So it's a fair question whether we got something wrong or whether that is actually the case. Yeah, we didn't. Uh, we did not model specific issues like this one. Okay. But again, you know. Uh, uh, this part specifically is not part of our work. This is the ALSIS model, so you know I can't really tell you exactly how reliable that is because I haven't seen it. I, I can judge. I, I trust it is reliable, but that was a surprise. That was a surprise for us. say something else regarding to that. It is true that uh, in a climate change perspective, there is a huge difference between um, this scenario here, which assumes uh, one degree warming by mid-century versus that this one here that assumes two degrees warming. It's immense, right? Mm -hmm. And at the moment, there is no probabilistic assessment of which one might happen. However, because they are based essentially on uh, uh, carbon emissions, year by year, we should get more understanding of which one might happen. Because carbon emissions are measured, this is physics, so it should be clear, become clear year by year which one we are, we are following. Now, once this gets clear, then we might say, okay, we know this one really is very focused. We might start to say, okay, forget about that. Now we found out the viability might be only between these two. And then when the year goes by, we 
we might end up with thinking, oh shit, you know, it's going to do this one. And then, you know, with less variability, we might start to address the variability in development specifically for that. So what I'm trying to say is that, ironically, because of how the scenario, the climate change scenario has been developed, it might be possible to predict on several years ahead, which is something we need to account in the interpretation of this was a lesson. Just speaking about the
um, goods, indigenous goods, that are owned by people. What does this research mean for them? So that when the final report comes out, that's really um, uh, succinctly mentioned in that report. So some of you may be staying for that meeting uh, to discuss that. And then, as Fabio said, the final report will be done in a few weeks. To, and then we'll be reviewing that, and then that'll be available. Kelly has um, uh, recorded this through their meeting that will be available online as well. So if you think anyone else that might be interested, please forward it on to them. All of this is available, whether it's Fabio said, just go to the Monty website and be through the MLC project and be able to access all their questions and I'm sure Fabio will be able to answer any more questions. So join me, thank you for coming.